To heal the brokenhearted, to bring liberty to those who are bruised. Lord, you came and you gave yourself for us. Oh, Lord, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. None of us would be here today if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for your sacrifice. And we just want to worship and praise you and thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, thank you. We give you all the praise and the glory. And, Lord, we ask that now you would come and that you would minister to us by your Holy Spirit. We thank and praise you and thank you so much for your love and your great goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I think it's the window. I think it's up there. It's coming from up there. The wind's behind. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, otherwise I'm going to lose all my notes. <laughs> well... Well, our subject today is taken from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 18. When the Lord Jesus had just come from the wilderness, being tested by the devil, and he came to the synagogue and was given to him the scroll of Isaiah. And it comes, it comes out a little differently in Luke's Gospel to what Isaiah prophesied, but basically it's the same thing. And so Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted or the shattered, preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised or crushed. And we all go through circumstances that bruise us, that crush us, that shatter us, that break our hearts. But this world is full of people who don't know how to get out of those terrible experiences. They have no hope. They just drown their sorrows, their misery with alcohol, with wrong fornication, with many partners trying to find happiness or drugs. This world is full of broken-hearted and bruised people. And God wants us to learn to triumph over our own bruisings, our own crushings, and that in turn that we can minister to others. So we look first at Jesus came to heal the broken-hearted. He was anointed to heal the broken-hearted. And our hearts can be broken by our sins, by our sinful lifestyle, things that we've done. And one time, in another country, we were living in another country, ministering the word of God, and a young woman came to see me. And she said, I had an abortion because I got pregnant on my honeymoon, and I did not want to start married life being pregnant and having a baby. So she said, I pleaded with my husband, please let me have an abortion. Husband said, no, 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 no. But she, she pleaded and pleaded and pleaded. And eventually he said, okay, you can have it. But for the last five years, they had been trying now to have a baby and they could not. She could not get pregnant. And so she was weeping and weeping. She was brokenhearted because of what she had done by killing, having that first baby killed in the womb. And now she couldn't have children. Five years trying, but nothing had happened. And so I shared with her and prayed with her. And she repented before the Lord. She asked the Lord to forgive her and to cleanse her from her sin. And then we came against the spirit of murder in her life because that's what she had opened herself up to. Maybe you can switch this one off. And so we prayed and we, we broke the power of the spirit of murder in her life. And she got a release and she went home very happy. Shortly afterwards, 
She called me, said, I'm pregnant. I'm having a baby. And she gave birth to a lovely girl. And then she had another girl after that. So God restored her. God healed her broken heart and forgave her sin because she truly repented. And now she has, I guess they're adult girls now. They're probably even married. She's probably got grandchildren now. An extra blessing. Praise the Lord. So when we are truly repentant we, we, and we confess our sins and we turn away from our sinful lifestyle, then the grace of God comes to help us. In Proverbs 28 and verse 13, He that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsakes them shall have mercy. Our hearts can be broken by grief over many, many different situations. Broken relationships, great disappointments, a wayward child who's gone off into the world in spite of all we've done to raise them in the ways of God, and especially the loss of a loved one, a spouse, or even a child. There was a lady in, in America and she lost her husband. He died. She was overcome with loneliness and grief. And she decided she was going to kill herself. So she got into her car and she drove up the mountains where there was a cliff. And she was planning to drive her car over the cliff and end it all. She was so unhappy. But on the way, she sensed somebody else was in the car. She looked at the passenger seat, and there was Jesus. And he said to her, I have many wonderful purposes yet for your life. And then he began to minister to her and bring healing. And her heart began to get warm, and she got hope. Hope filled her heart at the presence and the love of God and what Jesus was saying. So she turned the car around, she drove back home, and God began to anoint her and bless her and use her greatly, great fruitfulness for the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Come unto me, all you that labour, that are weary, that are heavy laden, burdened down, and I will give you rest. As the man of sorrows, Jesus suffered a lot of hurt and rejection in his life here on earth. And he understands. He knows our sorrows. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne all our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He has borne all our sorrows, all our heartaches, and he understands. And he alone can heal the broken heart as we bring our sorrows to him for healing. And then he can use us to heal others and minister to others. And Jesus in Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 7 and 8, it says that Jesus in the days of his flesh, it would be between the ages of 12 years and 28 years when God was polishing his humanity, preparing him for his ministry. But Jesus had strong crying and tears. And that strong crying, when it's like you feel like your insides are going to burst because of the grief that you're carrying. Jesus knows that. He experienced that. He knows that when we go through that. Praise the Lord. And then we want to look at Isaiah 61 and verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness or depression that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Beauty for ashes. A friend of mine had a vision. 
and she saw a man in the who would have been alive in the time of Isaiah with long garments, and he was sitting on a pile of ashes. It was all over his clothes, it was in his hair, it was all over his face. He had suffered great disappointment. My friend did not know what that disappointment was, but she saw Jesus come and gently and carefully begin to wash him, wash his face, wash his hair and his clothes. And Jesus removed all the ashes that had come into his life. And this is what the Lord does to us if we allow him. He removes the effects of the circumstances that have brought us into the place of ashes, where our hopes, our dreams, even our future looks like just a pile of ashes. And so, whether it's a trauma, a grief, abuse, or deep disappointment, whatever those ashes are, he comes, and if we allow him and we yield to him, he comes and he cleanses those ashes away. And he turns the ashes and the effects of our situations. And he brings back beauty into our lives. He gives us purpose and meaning. Hallelujah. Now in Psalm 84 and verse 6, it says that we pass through the valley of Baca, which is the valley of weeping or the valley of tears. But we make it a well, a well. Now there's been a well made here in recent months. And a well speaks of life. We can go 40 days, up to 40 days without food. But we cannot go many days without water. Because water is life. And when we were living in India, we lived in South India for 13 years and we're ministering in different parts of the country and we found what it was like to have no water. Um, for the first four years, we lived in the plains in Madras, it was called then, now Chennai, and then we moved up into the hills, into the mountains and our water supply came from the town that we were living in and it was, would flow into a holding tank on our property and then by electricity it would be pumped up the hill to another holding tank at the top of the hill and then the water would run down through pipes into the houses. Well, we had a lot of brownouts and there was no electricity at times and so the water tank at the top became empty very quickly. And we had no water, so we had to go searching for water. We had an old 1961 Jeep, and so we would put lots of buckets and vessels and containers in the back, and then we would drive around the town looking for water. And then we found a small running stream, and so we took out all the containers, and we sat them on the ground, we had a dipper, and we put a cloth over the mouth of the container and we'd scoop up the water and pour it through the cloth and fill up all the containers. And then we'd drive back home. But the problem was we lived on a hill. And so by the time we got home, all the containers were half empty <laughs> because it was running out the back of the old Jeep. And so we would have to turn around and go back and get more water until we had enough. Then we had to boil the water for 20 minutes. Then we had to strain it through a cloth again. Then we had to put it into a filter and then we could drink it. So it was quite a process. But water is life. And that's what God wants to do with our sorrows, with our broken hearts, with our tears. As we go through the valley of Baca, the valley of weeping, that our tears are put into the well of God. And that from that well, we can draw out and we can minister to others. Praise the Lord. And then Isaiah 61 continues, The oil of joy for mourning. 
When somebody was anointed in the word of God, as we heard yesterday, oil was poured over their heads. And my husband spoke on the precious ingredients of the anointing oil. And Psalm 133, when Aaron was anointed as the high priest, that precious oil ran over his head, down his beard, down his clothes, right down to the ground. And so God wants to pour his precious oil of joy over our hearts and our minds when we are in a place of mourning. And Psalm 30, verse 11 says, You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth, and you have girded me with gladness. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes, Nehemiah 8 and verse 10. He exchanges our mourning for joy. Now, joy is different to happiness. Happiness depends on our circumstances. If we have plenty of money, we have plenty of food, the family is well, we are well, we are happy. But if sickness comes, if we have financial difficulties, debts begin to pile up, and problems come, happiness disappears. But joy is supernatural. Joy comes from the Lord. Joy is in spite of our circumstances. You probably are familiar with the wonderful pastor Richard Wormbrandt, who was put in prison by the communists many years ago in Romania. He was in prison because he was a pastor, because he was a Christian. He was in prison about 13 or 14 years. And daily they would drag him out and torture him. He came to New Zealand, where we are from, and as a 11 or 12-year-old girl, I heard him speak. And he took off his shirt, and he turned around, and we saw big holes in his back where they would take cigarettes that were lighted and burn big holes in his back. And he told us that one time, I think he was in Germany, and the young people were having a rally for communism, waving their flags, their communist flags and their banners. And he jumped out in front of them. He ripped off his shirt and said, look what communism has done to me. And they were stunned and they put down their banners and their flags and they all turned and went home. But he suffered terrible torture. How did he endure that? How did he go through all that? Well, he said... He would be, at night, they would throw him back in his cell. He was in agony, terrible pain. His clothes were all torn. He was hungry. He was cold. But then, then, the supernatural joy of the Lord would come down over him and he would get up and he would dance and dance and dance and rejoice and praise the Lord for, a, for hours in his cell. And this happened every single night. It was the supernatural joy of the Lord that gave him the strength, that precious fruit of the Holy Spirit. And then Isaiah 61 and verse 3 continues, that the Lord gives us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Now the spirit of heaviness is also a spirit of depression. And many, many people suffer from terrible depression. And it's a spirit often that needs to be bound and broken over their lives. When we get cold, the most comforting thing we do is to wrap a nice warm blanket around us or put on a nice warm garment. And the longer that blanket or garment is wrapped around us, the warmer and comforted we feel. Well... Praise is like that garment. That verse says, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And we can wrap that garment of praise around us that will remove the cold of heaviness, depression, and sadness. A good place to start praising the Lord is to thank God 
for his wonderful gift that he gave in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Through sending his son, we can know the fellowship with God in this life and for eternity. And we can continue to praise him for his wonderful, wonderful goodness. We need to acknowledge in these times that God is good. He is good and there is nothing evil in him. He is incapable of doing anything evil. And many people struggle with this. God, why does God allow me to go through this problem? Why has he allowed this circumstance in my life? And we all struggle with that at times. But we have to learn to trust the goodness of God. When Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory on Mount Sinai, in Exodus 33 and verse 19, the Lord said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. Goodness is the glory of God. And one time, the Lord appeared to Pastor Bailey and he held out his arm and he said, Touch me, I am altogether goodness. And Pastor Bailey understood from that that the Lord was totally unable to do anything evil or unkind. And Sister Bailey, she told us that when her husband her father, I'm sorry, when her father was dying, she was holding him in her arms and he died in her arms. She was broken hearted. She cried out, oh God, why, why, why Lord? And the Lord spoke to her and he said, Romans chapter 8 verse 28 works all the time or it does not work at all. All. What is Romans 8, verse 28? We know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Oh, that's a hard one sometimes, isn't it? How we, th we have a situation, we think, oh God, how can anything good come out of this circumstance? But as we, we go through our trials with a right attitude, God can comfort us. He can heal our broken hearts so that we in turn can heal others. We can encourage others. We don't understand. We don't know the end from the beginning. But God does. He never makes mistakes. If God made mistakes, he would not be God. Would he? He'd be, he'd be like us, fault, full of fault. We're full of faults, make mistakes, but not the Lord. All things. And so he said to Sister Bailey, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, works all the time, or it does not work at all. The Lord is not capable of doing anything evil. And if we praise him, we keep on that garment of praise when we're tempted to be down in the dumps, to be just so discouraged. As we praise him, heaviness begins to go. Depression has to leave. And the more we make a habit of praising the Lord, the greater will be the results. The devil hates praise and worship. And so as we, as we use our praise and our worship as a as a, a weapon against the enemy, he will back off and God will give us the victory. There was a man in New Zealand and he came back from the hospital. His wife had just died in the hospital and it was night time. He had, I think, four or five small children upstairs asleep. He was left with these precious little children. He was so broken hearted and he was weeping before the Lord. And then the Lord spoke to him from Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth. You have girded me with gladness that my 
my glory may sing praise unto you and not be silent. And God gave him the tune to that scripture. Some of you older ones like me might remember that song. Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing for me. Thou hast put off my sackcloth. Please sing with me if you know it. Thou hast turned my mourning into dancing for me and girded me with gladness. To thee in my glory may sing praise unto thee and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Amen. And that song went all throughout New Zealand and Australia, and it seems like it came to the Philippines as well, because some of you know it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And he began to dance. His sorrow, that was like his morning clothes fell off, and he began to dance and dance and dance around the room and rejoiced and praised, and that praise, that garment of praise just covered him, and his sorrow was turned to joy. Now, Pastor Bailey... When his wife died, he was so broken-hearted, so broken-hearted. And he said that after the burial, he was walking through the hotel lobby back to his hotel room, and he said, suddenly, the joy of the Lord came upon him, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And he said it was like chains fell off him, morning clothes just dropped off him, and he began to dance. Now, if you know Pastor Bailey, he's a very um, refined gentleman <laughs> from England. And he doesn't do things like that and naturally. But he said he got back to his room and he just danced and he danced and he danced and he worshipped and he glorified the Lord for so long. And he told us that even days and days afterwards, in his, when he was back in his apartment, he said, the joy of the Lord would come again, the garment of praise, and he would dance and dance and dance all around the room. He said, I was amazed at all the footwork I could do. He said it was amazing. I think he was, he was blown away <laughs> by how God caused him to dance and rejoice. Hallelujah. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. All right, so now we're going to look back at Luke 4, 18, where Jesus said that he came to set at liberty those who are bruised or crushed. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 and verse 1, Jesus said unto his disciples, It is impossible that offences will come. In other words, it is impossible for offences not to come. And when they do come, we can be crushed and bruised by people. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 10 and verse 6, we read that the journey of the children of Israel through the wilderness is an example to us of our spiritual journey. The things they went through in a like figure we will go through also. So we know that after they crossed the Red Sea, they saw their enemies, the Egyptians, destroyed. They rejoiced, they danced, they worshipped, and then they began their journey into the wilderness. And in Exodus chapter 15 and verses 22 to 25, they travelled three days and they found no water. They were thirsty or their cattle were thirsty, and then they came to a place where there was water. And so they rushed to drink it, but the water was bitter. And in their disappointment, they murmured and complained against Moses. And the, Moses said, Lord, what shall I do? And the Lord showed him a tree to cut down and to throw into the waters. And the waters were healed, and they were able to drink. Now, they called that place Mara, and Mara means bitter, bitter. Mary, her name comes from Mara, and my name, Marilyn, also comes from Mara. <laughs> and we will all come to Mara experiences. 
and we will all pass through bitter experiences, bruising or crushing by other people, disappointments, betrayals, the list goes on. But in Exodus 15 and verse 25 it says, There God proved them, the people, or tested them. And we also will be tested in bitter experiences. We can become bitter or better. By God's grace, we can become better and we can help others to not be bitter, but to become better. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up troubles you, and thereby many are defiled. We get hurt, we are bitter, we tell others, they get a root of bitterness coming up in their heart, they tell others, they have a root of bitterness coming up in their heart and the Bible says many are defiled. Bitterness keeps us in bondage. But God wants to give us the grace to choose to forgive. There was a certain church and the pastor came to Pastor Brian Bailey and said, I have a church full of wounded people. They're so hurt. They're all wounded. But God spoke to Pastor Bailey and said, Oh no, he has a church of people who have failed from the grace of God to forgive. Ooh, <laughs> that's really zeroing in in the painful part, isn't it? They have failed from receiving the grace of God to forgive. And we do not want to fail that test. We will all be tested by the waters of Mara, the bitter experiences. And that tree that Moses threw into the waters speaks to us of the cross. We must take all our hurts, our bitternesses, to the cross. Our rights, our pride, our broken hearts, our bitter feelings are all crucified with Christ. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live, by, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. One of the things that Jesus said when he was nailed to the cross in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, he cried out, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. They did not know they were crucifying the Lord of glory. But Jesus, if he could forgive, he can give us the grace to choose to forgive. Now forgiveness most people wait until they feel like forgiving, but that feeling never, ever comes. We never feel like forgiving. It's a choice. It's a decision. I choose to forgive no matter how we feel, even though our hearts are broken. It's an act of our will. And Jesus said in Mark chapter 11, Verse 26, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And we heard a true story of a lady evangelist in America. She was greatly used of God. She traveled all around, saw many wonderful things happen, many souls saved, many healings, many deliverances. And she would go on these crusades and see wonderful, wonderful moves of God. One day she came back from a crusade and she found her husband had had an affair. It happened only once. He was broken hearted. He was truly repented. He begged her, please forgive me. I hate what I've done. I will never do it again. 
please forgive me. But she would not. She said, no, I will never forgive you. you. And then she turned on God. She said, God, here I am serving you. I'm out sacrificing, leaving my family, doing your ministry, and you will let my husband commit adultery while I'm gone. How could you do that to me? And she became bitter, more bitter, and more bitter. Now, eventually, the husband died, and then the lady evangelist, she died. And then someone, a godly person, who knew them both very well, had a vision. She looked into heaven, and there was the husband, washed in the blood of Jesus. He had repented, truly repented. And he was forgiven, and he was rejoicing in the, in the presence of the Lord with all other saints. And then the vision changed, and this person was shown hell. And in hell, there was the lady evangelist. She would not forgive her husband, and Jesus said, if we do not forgive, the Heavenly Father will not forgive us our sins. It's very, very serious. You can lose your salvation if you refuse to forgive. And we are all tested in this way, all of us. Now, in Matthew chapter 18 and verses 21 to 22, Peter asked Jesus, he said, Lord, how many times do we have to forgive the same person? Do we have to forgive them seven times? Now, seven times is a lot of times. And Jesus said, no, but 70 times seven. How many times is that? 490 times. What about if the person sins against us 491 times? Do we still have to forgive? Yes, yes, we do. In other words, we have to forgive continually. How many times does Jesus forgive us when we sin? Does he forgive us only 490 times? No, he continually forgives if we are truly repentant. If we just say, oh Lord, forgive me, I'm going to do it again. You know, that doesn't wash with the Lord. But when we are truly repentant, he continually forgives us. And then in Matthew 18, verses 23 to 35, Jesus told a story. There was a certain king, and one of his servants owed him a lot of money. He called the, the servant and he said, pay me back what you owe me. And the servant fell down before the king. He said, oh, Lord, give me time. Have patience with me. I will pay back everything. But the king had compassion on his servant. And he said, okay, I will totally forgive you this whole debt. Well, that servant was so happy. He went out and he was walking down the street. And oh, along came another servant. Ha, huh, that man owed him some money. Just a small amount. And he went to that other man and he grabbed him by the throat and he said, pay me back what you owe me. And that man fell down before him and said, oh, have patience with me. Give me time, I will pay back everything. But that first servant, he said, no, I'm going to throw you in the prison. And he threw his, that man into the prison just because he owed a small amount, whereas he himself had been forgiven a huge amount by the king. Well, word got back to the king what he had done. The king was so angry. He called that servant back. He said, I forgave you a huge debt because you asked me to. But you would not forgive your friend a small debt and you've thrown him in the prison. And so the king threw that man, that first servant, first servant, into the prison also and delivered him to the tormentors, those who would torment him until he could pay back what he owed. And then Jesus said in verse 35, So shall my heavenly Father do also unto you 
if from your hearts you do not forgive everyone his brother their trespasses, their sins against you. What will the Father do to us if we don't forgive? Verse 34. He will deliver us to the tormentors. We will open ourselves to the tormentors. And we know who they are. It's the demon spirits. Spirits of bitterness, anger, hate, fear, depression, even sickness. And so if we refuse to forgive, when God has forgiven us a huge amount of sins, a big pile of debt, we have to choose to forgive others. Otherwise, we open ourselves up to the tormentors, the spirits that will torment us. Now, some years ago, I had a very bitter experience and some people rose up against me and I knew I had to forgive them. And so I said, Lord, I choose to forgive them. Now, my ki our kids were small, our children were small, and my husband would travel a lot, and I would be left with the children. And every night when he was gone, I would get up, and I would walk up and down in the room, and I would weep and weep, say, Lord, I forgive them. Lord, I choose to forgive them. What's wrong with me? I can't get released, this, the terrible pain. Lord, I choose to forgive them. I will forgive them. Oh, God, what's wrong with me? And that went on for some months. But the Lord always hears our prayers. And the Lord sent Pastor and Sister Bailey to where we were ministering. And I said to Sister Bailey, I've had a very bitter experience. I, I think I've forgiven them, but I just can't stop weeping. I'm weeping night after night when my husband's away. Uh, what's wrong with me? And then she said, Marilyn, you have forgiven, but you have not yet forgotten. Oh, forgetting is something we choose to do, but forgetting is supernatural. It is something the Lord has to cause us to do. And so she took me to Genesis Chapter 41 and verse 51. And it's the story of Joseph naming his two sons. And we know that Joseph went through a terrible time, a terrible time with his brothers who hated him, threw him in a pit, who delivered him to the Midianites. He was sold as a slave. He was falsely accused of immorality. Then he was thrown in a terrible, dirty dungeon for many years and forgotten, it seemed. But then, in God's time, God raised him up and God blessed him and he got married. He had two sons. And Sister Baby said to me, the names of these two sons have a spiritual meaning. And the first one he called Manasseh. What does Manasseh mean? Manasseh means forgetting, forgetting. And Joseph said, God has made me or caused me to forget all my toil, my sorrow, my misery, and all what I suffered in my father's house. This is supernatural. And she said, Marilyn, you need to ask God to give you a spiritual Manasseh, the ability to forget the pain of the experience you've been through. She said, take it by faith. Lift your hands to the Lord and say, Lord, give me my Manasseh. Give me the ability to forget the pain. Then place your hands on your head like a hat and believe God that he will give that to you. So I said, okay. I went home and I said, Lord, I prayed every day for a week. Lord, give me my Manasseh. Oh, God, give me my Manasseh for a whole week. And then I forgot about it. <laughs> Eight months later, I suddenly remembered. Oh, I'm not weeping anymore. The pain has gone. I still remember what was said and done. I'm healed. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm healed. I'm healed. 
and I, that was many years ago. My kids were little then, now they're in their 40s, so that's a long time ago. And I've never wept a tear since. Oh, hallelujah. And so, I, then, then Sister Batty had also said, now this, the name of the second son, well, maybe we'll get onto that in a minute. We must ask God. We choose to forgive. That's what we must do, and ask God to forgive our bitterness to cleanse our hearts from resentment, hatred, anger, bitterness. And then we can ask him for a spiritual manasseh, taking it by faith, like I did, placing it on your head. Now, some situations hurt and bruise us more than other situations. And sometimes we have to keep on asking for that spiritual manasseh until we know that we have it. And there are times... We have to forgive the same person every single day and ask for a spiritual manasseh every single day, the ability to forget. And as we yield to the Lord and ask him to change us in these times and ask him to develop the beautiful fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, to develop his love, his joy, his peace, his long-suffering, his gentleness, his goodness, his faith, his meekness, his self-control, the character of Christ. And as the waters of Mara were made sweet, so the Lord wants the sweetness of his character developed more and more in us. Now, in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20, after Joseph's father, Jacob, had died and been buried, his brethren were terrified. They thought, surely Joseph, Joseph now will kill us or put us in prison for what we did to him. And they went to him and they fell down before him and said, oh, please forgive us. And of course, Joseph had already forgiven because he said God had given him the ability to forget or the pain he had chosen to forgive. And in verse chapter 50, verse 20, Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to save many lives in many nations. And that's what God used him for. So Joseph's sorrows, all what he suffered, led him step by step to the highest place of honour next to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Also Job, Job's sufferings. Job chapter 42 and verse 10. God gave him twice as much as he had before. After he'd lost all his children, all his animals, his cattle, his flocks, and that was smitten with those terrible, painful boils. All that was bringing Job to the place of the greatest blessing. And God blessed him in the end more than he had at his beginning. And often that's the way with our bitter experiences. They are leading us, if we will um, handle them the way God wants us to, to forgive and ask God to for help us to forget. They are leading us into the purposes of God. Now, if I hadn't forgiven and if I hadn't known about forgetting, I would never be here today. Never, ever, ever. I'd probably be in a pit of misery and goodness knows what. But God wants to bless us and he allows things to happen for our good, to bring us on into the purposes of God, into the high calling of God. And the second son that Joseph had was, he called him Ephraim. Ephraim means fruitful or double fruitfulness. And he said in Genesis 41, verse 52, God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. God wants our lives to be fruitful, to be doubly fruitful, 
to be fruitful, to be used in ways we've never expected. It's amazing what God can do in us and through us as we go on, as we go through the trials and, and we choose to forgive and we seek to put the Lord first and to yield to his dealings. Lord, I don't understand, but you said you, you, that you work all things together for my good, so I trust you. Lord, I praise you. Help me, Lord. Give me the grace to go through this trial. And he will. He will cause us to be fruitful and give us an Ephraim. Now, we cannot have an Ephraim a fruitfulness for the Lord, unless first we have a Manasseh, a holy forgetfulness. We cannot have a Manasseh, a forgetfulness, unless we first choose to forgive. Praise the Lord. So, God wants us to have our broken hearts healed be set free from our crushings and our bruisings. He wants us to walk in victory and in the freedom that Jesus won for us on the cross. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest the savour or the fragrance of his knowledge by us in every place. God is able to always cause us to triumph in Christ if we have our attitudes right and we can help others to triumph in Christ. And sometimes I've said, Lord, I don't understand this situation, but I thank you. You're going to cause me to triumph because your word says that you always cause us to triumph in Christ. And Lord, I want that fragrance of your character to be spread through my life for your glory. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Don't remember the things that are old, the former things, neither considers the thing, the, consider the things of old. Behold, the Lord says, I will do a new thing. It shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near unto them who are of a broken heart, and save such as be as a contrite spirit. Psalm 147, and verse 3. He heals the broken in heart, and he binds up their wounds. Many people are desperate today. They have scars from being wounded, from being crushed and broken. There's many broken hearts, broken marriages. I come from a broken marriage. My parents split, separated when I was young, very small. My father left us. And I know that the heartache my mother, well, some of the heartache my mother went through. But she held on to God and she did not allow bitterness. And God healed her broken heart. And God can, can heal the broken hearts. So I saw it in my mum. I've experienced myself. And God wants to anoint us to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those who are bruised and crushed. But we need to experience his healing first before we are able to minister to others. And that verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so we can comfort others who are in any trouble with the comfort, the same comfort we have received from the Lord, we can use that comfort to comfort others. He wants to anoint us to heal the brokenhearted and to set at liberty those who are bruised and crushed. Now I'm going to ask my husband to come and he's going to lead us in prayer for those perhaps of you that have a wounded heart. Perhaps you're struggling to forgive and God wants to give you a manasseh as you choose to forgive. 
And he wants to give you a Ephraim, a double fruitness, fruitfulness for the kingdom of God. God bless you.